it's probably about 9 a.m. in the morning, more or less. But we don't know that because I was trying to do shadow readings with this bracket. I didn't know it was a bracket until Eric cracked the case. I thought this shadow might have been made from a little hole in the piece of wood, you know, where you would tie up your horse or something like that. But it turned out to be a bracket, so it didn't help me with any kind of sun shadow readings. But at about 8 or 9 a.m., it would have been John Breckenridge's division that was stacked up behind John Brown Gordon's division that was already at 8 a.m. south of town on South Market Street. You had Ramsey's division that came into town first in the early morning, but they head directly east to fight on the Baltimore Pike very early in the morning. So when Early comes into town at about 8 a.m., he directs that he wants $200,000 in payment. So you probably had Breckenridge's division that were the guys that were looking for most of the banks and the warehouses and depots. So I can't say for sure, but my best guess is maybe that this is the division of John C. Breckenridge, who was a vice president under Buchanan before the war started. Because Gordon's troops, his division <coughs> lined up just behind Gordon's troops, and they were held in reserve all day that the day the Battle of Monocacy was fought. So Breckenridge's guys didn't go into battle. They waited down in the Buckystown Pike all afternoon to be called into action. They never were. If this is the morning of September 10th, then these are Jackson's guys. We don't know who. It's very unlikely. The only other day that this photo could have been taken is basically three days because of the way the troops are facing. The only other day was September 11th when D.A. Hill's guys <coughs> left Frederick. But they were the last troops in the Army of Northern Virginia that left Frederick. Last infantry. <coughs> These guys are infantry from the long infield rifles. They're not cavalry. Now, one of the other things, too, is there's hardly any musket slings on these guys. That may not mean much, but it's just something to consider. Also, the fact that I didn't really see a whole lot of bayonets either hanging from the belt, but you can't really see the side of the body, which is the opposite side of the body where the bayonet would hang down. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes? You had said that Rosenstock had given or donated the photo original, the original to uh, the neighbor's guy in D.C. Actually, two originals, the two okay. Union photos, yeah. So, the neighbor was able to provide you with the original, they're missing or lost? They were lost or missing in year 1961, but they provided us with copy photos that Ben Rosenstock later supplied to them after the fact. So luckily, Ben Rosenstock had photographed his own interest in prints, so he had some substandard copies. A little 30-second footnote, too, to what Paul was just talking about, and a little plug for the Maryland room upstairs, and some of the very um, resourceful, valuable things that are found up there. This, uh, what we're looking at here on the screen, is a uh, weather report record kept by the Quinn Hardware Store in Frederick during the Civil War. These are the dates over here, and the days that we here. We got July 7th, 8th, and 9th. Um, this is handwritten. She has the original up upstairs. Um, Document MR number 7. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, says, you know, the battle one mile west of Frederick. Uh, the Confederate soldiers entered the city of Frederick. Uh, the battle in the Nazi three miles east of Frederick. The Confederate levied a contribution of $200,000. It's all handwritten stuff. It's right upstairs. And it's one of the longest weather diaries on the East Coast. <laughs> I guess he kept it for about 30 or 40 years. Know, the family, probably, the twin brothers. It was a long time. Wow. So this showed us what the weather was, along with the Union newspaper had a few weather snippets. But the weather was pretty much clear and sunny and nice every day in September when the Confederates were there for six days until the fall. Until September 11th, when D.H. Hill moves out. Now, the last Confederates that left Frederick in September 1862 were the cavalry, <coughs> and they fight a skirmish on the 12th. But it's not cavalry in the photo, so we know it's not September 12th. Any others? No, yes. and no more questions for Paul, Eric? You can put yes. the lights on again. We'll the address if you want to walk there. The address today, I believe, is 27, oh. is the Byron Modern 1915 building. And the store where Rosenstock rented from for five years is now number 25. 
Now, what's interesting is the numbers changed in year 1911, which further created confusion for us. So, there's a lot of, lot of things that were very, very difficult to nail down. This is the Rosenstock today, so the, per the perfect travel store. And the or the spot where he rented for five years. Or yeah. more. So, this is a lot of You can see how bright the sun was. Yeah, so to answer your question, 27 North Market is where the photo was taken out of. Now, him and I hope to get some money together and create a large wooden sign that's going to hang up there that says Rosenstock. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to sell a million truffles to tourists that want to come by and see the, stop, the spot, I think it's a great, I think it's a great business promotion for the, the guys that now run the truffle store. And by the way, this truffle store made the chocolate mini balls that we obtained from the Civil War Medicine Museum. If you haven't been there, it's a fantastic place. The Medicine Museum is really phenomenal and it needs all of our support. So we're going to try to support them as much as possible. Yep. So, so your, your before and after photograph is what kind of sets you off on this quest. You just saw some anomalies there and felt like this, this isn't quite right the way they have these planes. And, and the way you went. Couldn't, couldn't say better myself. No. <laughs> oh, one last thing about the possible July 9th date is the fact that by about July 2nd or 3rd, everybody in Frederick gets word that Jubal Army is on Jubal Early's army is on the way, like around Winchester. They're, they may be coming to Frederick. So people start boarding up houses and start locking stuff up. Now when Jubal Early makes this ransom for two hundred thousand dollars. There's no guarantee that the money's going to be paid. The city might be set on fire. So it's very possible that the fire police rush over from their home on Patrick Street, or if they left one of their assistants to sleep on the third floor at a cot at night or something like that, just to guard the place. If the rebels really want to come in, they're going to kick the door down. But you keep the door locked from the inside. So it's possible that maybe Byerly's son or an assistant took this photo. We really don't know. But it kind of makes sense that they might have been in the studio on the morning of July 9th thinking, look, if the whole building goes up in flames, at least we can save some of our livelihood. We can get the cameras out. We can get some of the equipment out. So maybe because the savings institution is right across the street, just to the left of where the photo is from, maybe they get word, somebody yelling on the street, hey, the money's going to be paid. The savings institution actually comes up with $64,000, the most of any of the five banks that pay the ransom payment. <laughs> One of the great interesting stories is late that afternoon on July 9th, there was a guy named Groshi, and he worked at the Beano Railroad <laughs> office. So late in the afternoon, after the Battle of Monocacy is over, a squad of rebel cavalry rides back into town. They want to set the Beano Railroad office on fire. At the time, this guy Groshin is in his 40s, age-wise. These young rebel cavalrymen are probably in their 20s, age-wise. Groshin's not armed, but he walks up to these armed rebel cavalrymen and he says, no, you're not going to set my place of employment on fire. We paid the ransom money. Our payment of $200,000 protects all property in this city. So the cavalrymen looked at each other and they said, this guy's got a point. They did pay the money for the fund. So they dispatched one of their riders back to Jubal Early and said, hey, this guy protested. He said, look, they paid the money. So Jubal Early says to the cavalrymen, yes, they did pay the money, ride back there and have those guys come ride back to camp and start being fired. Because Early might have thought twice about that. He thought, look, if we don't win the war, then I set something on fire after we were paid. I might be hung for war crimes after we lose this war. So it's a very, very interesting story. And that story came from the 1902 claim where Frederick, long after the war, many, many times, they wanted compensation from the federal government because they lost like the equivalent of a billion dollars in today's money, which $200,000 was a lot, a lot of jack back in those days. So, they petitioned the federal government for years and years and years, please repay this. We were the victim of this circumstance. If we didn't pay, we were going to get burned out. We had to do what we had to do. But please, how are we going to compensate all these banks and all these people that lost all the money? They could never get the claim. The claim was finally paid in 1951. 
And some of the interest on the interest, on the interest, on the interest, on that interest was finally not resolved until 1969, more than 100 years after the war. <laughs> Anyway, anything else? Nice job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>